is currently under contract with Oxford University Press. In addition to doing professional research, Dr. Sullivan is a beloved teacher at Notre Dame. And I hear this from my sources on the ground at Notre Dame. Only the highest grades for her new class called God and the Good Life, in which students wrestle with some of the deepest questions pertaining to what makes for a meaningful life, whether God exists, uh, whether religious belief is rational, and what might our moral obligations Dr. Sullivan's topic today, I think, is one that captures the spirit of the great Thomas Aquinas, whose work in philosophy was so often at the service of theology. His understanding of being, substance, causation, change, for example, gave shape to his articulation of tricky theological doctrines on the Trinity, divine attributes, and the Incarnation. And when it came to understanding the dogma of the real presence in the Holy Eucharist, Aquinas put to work philosophical notions of matter and form, substance and accident. So, in this tradition of using philosophical tools to shed light on theological truths, Dr. Sullivan will speak to us this evening about the Eucharist. The title of her talk is, as you see up here, One Eternal Sacrifice, uh, Contemporary Theories of Time and Change, and the Eucharistic sacrifice. So Dr. Sullivan will give a talk and then we'll have a period of Q&A afterward. Um, just one note of business, if you could make sure your cell phones are silenced, I would be so very grateful. Please check, so thanks so much. Please help me to welcome Dr. Megan Sullivan. Saturday night, and so many seemingly rational individuals decide to come, so I, I'm very grateful to you all. This is my first time uh, visiting Cleveland, and everyone at the Borromeo Seminary and everyone I've met has been absolutely fantastic. Um, Beth and Greg and Father Damien took me all around town today. I got to buy this awesome shirt, I just want to show off. If we accomplish nothing else on this trip, it's that I was able to purchase this amazing Cleveland is Magical t-shirt. <laughs> tonight is a topic I've been thinking about quite a bit, both in my civilian life and a little bit in my professional life as a philosopher. This is the first time I've ever shared this publicly, so I'm hoping the Q&A will be more of a discussion and less of like you guys roasting me theologically. <laughs> uh, but there, it's, it's a theory that I've been, I've been thinking about quite a bit, and I eventually hope to work into a bigger project on the nature of the church. And to, it's in answer to a question, how, when we celebrate the Eucharist, we could be really participating in Christ's sacrifice. Before we get into the theology and the metaphysics, I thought it might be helpful, since you guys are just meeting me, for me to tell you a little bit about why I care about the answer to this question. Sometimes these more abstract metaphysical theological questions can, uh, can, can lose their grip on us if we don't remember why we started wondering about them in the first place. Um, so a little bit about me. I joined the Catholic faith as a college student. So I could RCA in my third year of college. I started attending church my second year of college. And there was a lot going on in my life at that point that brought me into the church. One thing that happened when I started college at the University of Virginia in 2001, that was right after the September 11th attacks happened. And I'd grown up in a family that like, wasn't particularly atheist, but definitely wasn't particularly Christian. Religion just kind of wasn't a thing in our environment growing up. And I didn't think I really wanted it to be part of my life when I started college. If you told me right now I'd end up an adult who's a really serious Catholic and a philosophy professor, I probably would have begged you to like, kill me at that point in my life. <laughs> um, but I arrived at college, this major world event happened, and also a big event was happening like inside of me. And I know that this probably happens to a lot of young people when they're away from home for the first time. I thought I had a really clear picture of who I was and what I cared about, and then I went away to college and realized I had a lot more questions than I had answers. The 9-11 attacks happened, and one of the things that those attacks did for me, I didn't know anybody in Washington, D.C. or New York at the time, but I did know that I wanted more than anything to be a successful professional adult someday. That was like the biggest goal that I had in my life. 
And then I started, you know, the attacks happened and I started thinking, here are a bunch of successful, professional adults exactly in the image of what I want my life to be like. And they all just went to work one day and died. And that's, like, that's the kind of world that we live in, a world where you could have everything and then in a moment it could be gone. And maybe, you know, this is like, you know, freshman philosophy major insight. A lot of you guys are like, yeah, I knew that when I was 14. It took me until I was 18 to realize that that was a big thing. Once I started thinking about it, it had a profound effect on me. So over the course of that first year of college, I was growing emotionally enough to start asking some questions that I had closed off previously in my life. And the Holy Spirit was starting, you know, to kind of whisper to me. And the first anniversary of the 9-11 attacks happened, and that was the first time I went to a church service. Um, and what happened that day, i have been having these questions for quite a while. I'd become much more interested in philosophy, but analytic philosophy was not answering those questions. I don't know if, how many of you guys have studied analytic philosophy. It's absolutely wonderful. It's worth a great deal of your time and attention. You should all buy books written by analytic philosophers. But it doesn't answer some of these big existential questions, and it certainly didn't answer the really deep emotional question that I had at this point. And so I remember the, the anniversary of 9-11 happened, and I called my family, and I was like, you know, Mom and Dad, I just wanted to talk to you guys about how much I love you, and how fleeting our lives are, but how valuable they are, but how short they are, and my mom is like, you know, it's Wednesday afternoon, I'm at work, I don't, I don't really have time to talk about this with you, but I love you too, and I'm not really sure where this is coming from, and we had a brief conversation, hung up, and I was like, that's also not what I'm looking for, but today I'm really searching for something. Who talks about these big questions if it's not philosophers and if it's not your parents? It's church people. It's you guys. So I'll go to a church service and maybe somebody will give a really inspiring philosophical speech about the meaning of lives and what we're searching for. Uh, this is going to be about the Eucharist in a second, so don't you worry. <laughs> I go to um, St. Thomas Aquinas Parish, which is the church that was near my dorm. Very providential. I think that there was a Catholic church that was so close to where I was at the time. And went to the weekday mass there. And it was an absolutely normal weekday mass. There was like four old ladies and the priest. Uh, the set of readings that were not at all keyed up to be around September 11th, a very short homily. And I sat through the mass. Here's a picture of the sanctuary at St. Thomas Aquinas. I sat through the Mass and didn't really understand at all what was going on. I had been to some Masses before as a child, but I didn't know. I didn't know why people were standing, what they were saying. But I did leave feeling like that was what I was looking for. Like there's something in this space with these people, what they're doing, that's the thing that I'm searching for. And I'm not finding it in philosophy, and I'm not finding it on my own, but I want to keep coming back to this place. So I started going back to weekday services, and then Sunday services, and then did RCIA, and now, long, complicated story, I'm here. I think the Eucharist is a big part of my spiritual life, that the Eucharist has this power. That we are in the, we're in the presence of God with this sacrament. It has the power to change us, and it's one of the most profound, direct ways in which we're able to interact with God. But, as St. Thomas definitely understood, it raises as many philosophical questions as it might seem to answer for us spiritually. And it's worth thinking about those questions. I think it's worth us to take a little bit of time to try to think through those puzzles. And that there are two stances we can take when we start to raise questions in philosophical theology, especially about things that are really sacred to us, like the Eucharist. One stance, I think, is the reverential stance. So we take the reverential stance when we're orienting our minds and our emotions to be in the presence of God. When we're in this mode, it's second personal. It's like me and God is right there. And you're trying to experience it intimately, and you're trying to uh, understand God as a person who's present right here in this moment. This is the stance that you should be in when you're at Mass, or when you are in the presence of God in Eucharistic adoration. But when you're in this stance, it doesn't make sense, I think, to raise these big metaphysical questions. Not to yourself. They're going to be a distraction. But there's another stance, the stance that we can adopt tonight, outside of the Mass, that can be just as important in a different way for our spiritual life. And this is what I want to call the philosophical stance. So when we adopt the philosophical stance to something like the Eucharist, 
We're looking for models that are going to help us understand God, or at least learn to ask new and better questions of God. Help us better understand that He exists. Help us better understand how His sacraments are efficacious, how they're working in the world, what His nature is. When we're in the philosophical stance, it's a little bit more third personal. So we're theorizing about God as though He's out there. And it's a little bit more detached. It's much more speculative, I think, than when we're experiencing God directly. And the primary thing we're doing is engaging with theodicy. So attempts to come up with explanations for why God does what he does for us. These are two really different stances, and, and they need to be separate. They're, they'd be inappropriate sometimes for us to conflate us. The best example I can think of is, like, you're celebrating your mother's birthday. And there are two ways you can think about your mother, stances you can take towards your mother. One is, like... You are at the birthday party, and you're just enjoying her company. She's there with you. You're giving her a hug. You're celebrating this important event with her. You should be in the reverential stance when you're with your mom in that mode. But there's another way you can think about your mother. If you've had to take any metaphysics classes, you might have taken up this stance. You can say, like, does my mother have a body? Could my mother survive the gradual replacement of all of her parts with new parts? Those are all, like, those are interesting questions that you can ask about your mother, but not at her birthday. <laughs> you know, listen, I don't know. Your mother and my mother would find that really inappropriate. When you're in the second personal stance, these questions are not appropriate. But there's still an occasion in which you could ask them. And there's a sense in which asking these metaphysical questions might help you understand some aspects of your mother more. But it's probably not even the most important ones. They're still a little bit important. Or I hope I can convince you of that tonight. So tonight we're adopting the philosophical stance with respect to this question of one particular question involving the Eucharist. There are obviously a lot of philosophical questions that we can ask in the philosophical stance about the Eucharist. The big ones that St. Thomas attacked were, how could this uh, substance in front of me that appears to be bread and wine actually be body and blood? It doesn't resemble body and blood at all. It doesn't seem to be caused in the right ways of body and blood. So how could it be those things? That's one really interesting metaphysical question. Another related question is, suppose you can convince yourself that these things could be body and blood. How could they be God? How could something like God be located here in the sacrifice? It's another deep philosophical question. Thomas did a good job on some of those, and I can't honestly do any better than him on those questions. So those we're going to set aside. We're going to set aside some of the big questions with the real presence tonight. And focus on another topic that I'm much more interested in as a philosopher of time. So, in my civilian life, or my professional life, I'm very interested in philosophy of religion, but my main area of research is the nature of time and change. And not insofar as it applies to philosophy of religion at all, but just in general. I go to a lot of philosophy conferences where religion doesn't come up at all. And I love thinking about these questions, but starting a couple years ago, I started to have more applied questions for my faith that came from my views in philosophy of time. And one of these questions is, when we celebrate the Eucharist, it's not only that we are in the presence of God, and that God is here, and this is his body and blood, but we are also participating in his sacrifice. To put a couple lines up from the Catechism that I think make some pretty interesting claims about the nature of time in the Eucharist. Um, just a couple to point out here. The first one is we're taught that this memorial, the Eucharist, isn't merely a recollection of past events, but it's the proclamation of the mighty works wrought by God for men. And this liturgical celebration of these events, they become, in a certain way, present and real. Present and real are like shock words if you're a professional metaphysician. It's like, what, what do you mean present? What do you mean real here and now? How could that be? When the church celebrates the Eucharist, we're told that the sacrifice offered once and for all on the cross is going to remain ever present to us. The victim is one and the same. The same now offers through the ministry of the priest who then offered himself on the cross. Only the mannering of offering is different. So I read about these in the catechism, and I thought about them. And as I thought more about them, I thought these raise some really interesting philosophical puzzles of how what I'm doing when I go to Mass tomorrow could possibly be linked up with the sacrifice that I believe was a real sacrifice in another point in history. How does how the, the timeline all meet up? To make the question even more precise, philosophers like to make things precise, let's put out some definitions. We'll define some terms so that we can try to raise the question even more precisely. So let's say that the event of Jesus' death and resurrection in human history, we're going to call that the Calvary event. 
happened sometime between 30 and 33 AD. I tried to check my sources to see what the official church timeline was before I got here, and that was as close as I could narrow it down. So feel free to narrow it even further. I put the little squiggle to say, like, plus or minus a, a year or three. The Calvary event is the real event in human history of Jesus' death and resurrection. That's how we're going to define it. And now we have five claims that might initially seem like they can't all fit together. So they'll pose a problem for the rationality of Catholic practice in celebrating the Eucharist. And here are the five claims. And I tried to state them in a way that non-Catholics would understand. Because I think typically, we'll come back to this at the end of the talk, what we're doing when we do this kind of philosophy is trying to articulate parts of our faith that we know, we're very confident in. We have this second personal experience of the Eucharist. But we want to try to make it se make sense third personally to people who might not have had that experience, who are just trying to understand the theory of it. So these are the claims trying to state in a way that non-Catholics can at least kind of understand what we believe. First, the cavalry event was completed over a three-day span in 33 AD. So let's call this the completeness claim. It is finished. When it was finished, it was finished. First claim, something that we believe that's important, that we have to make sense of somehow. Second claim, when we celebrate the Eucharist, we are a participant in the Calvary event. That is one of the main messages from those passages from the Catechism. We're there. We're participating in it. <coughs> Third claim, someone participates in an event at a time only if the person exists at T and the event is occurring at T. So no matter how hard you try, I hate to break it to you, you could never participate in a battle in the Civil War. Are there any like Civil War reenactors here? No? Good. I'm from the South, so if I were giving this talk back in North Carolina, they'd be like, you, yeah, speak for yourself. <laughs> you can participate in a reenactment of a battle in the Civil War, but I'm sorry you guys are too late on the scene to be part of those events. You have to be there, you have to, at the minimally, be there at the time to participate in an event that's occurring at that time. Third claim. Fourth claim, contemporary Catholics and Orthodox Christians do celebrate the Eucharist. This is something that we do. Fifth claim, no contemporary Catholic or Orthodox Christian existed in 33 AD. So this is a claim about all of y'all. Like, none of you guys are that old. In fact, a lot of you guys, like, not even close to that old. But none of you guys were there, actually, at the cross. I certainly wasn't. So how can these five claims be true? You might think, on surface, they look like a straightforward, logical contradiction. And that might push you to start wanting to drop claims. This is how philosophers usually set their trap, get you to agree to all of these premises, and then boom, logical contradiction. We call it the principle of explosion. It's very violent in philosophy. So then you've got to figure out which ones you're going to get rid of to get rid of the contradiction. That might be your first reaction to this puzzle. So you might think, oh, one more claim we might want to add. I was really uncertain about this when I was thinking and praying about this talk this week. Is the first Eucharistic event was celebrated before the Calvary event was completed. So the, the, the Last Supper was a Eucharistic event. Happened before Christ's death and resurrect, resurrection. If, I don't know how logically troubling that one is, so I wasn't sure it needed to be on the list of five. But that's something, that's an important data point that our theory has to account for. So which claim should we drop? Here's going to be my basic strategy with the rest of this talk. One of my favorite philosophers of religion is a guy named Brian Leftow. Have you guys heard of Brian Leftow? He's the Nolith Professor of the Christian Religion at Oxford. Um, he's a very careful analytic philosopher, but also seriously faithful. He wrote this really cool paper about the Trinity called The Latin Trinity. And here's, I recommend this to you guys if you're interested in philosophical theology, but but Leftow's basic strategy with this is let's take the orthodox teachings about the nature of the Trinity, which seem like a logical contradiction. One substance, but three persons. One does not equal three, therefore contradiction. And he tries to show how he can give a model that those claims could all be consistent. Even if that's not actually how God's Trinity works, even if the Trinity remains a mystery for us, it's at least possible that they all be consistent. So that opens some room for faith. I take Leftow's model of how to argue as a philosopher is kind of my model for this talk. So I'm going to try to give you guys a model for how all five of those claims could be true. I don't know if that's how God is doing. The Eucharistic mystery is, is partially a mystery. There are some facts about it we might not know unless God directly reveals them to us at some point. But at the very least, there's nothing embarrassing about a Catholic believing that she is present at the sacrifice when she participates in the sacrament and Mass. So that's going to be my goal. Some people don't want to take that route. 
They think, like, let's not bother trying to make all these claims consistent. Instead, what we should do is just start picking some claims to drop or re-understand. So one is, you might think, well, we need to re-understand premises one and three because really the Eucharistic sacrifice happened outside of time. Once we're outside of time, it doesn't the idea of us participating in an event at a time or the event being completed in time, those don't really make sense anymore as stated. This is a view, it's a view that some in the church have worked really hard to articulate for us and one that I'm very happy to talk about in Q&A. I'll confess, as a philosopher and a Catholic, I find some of the views of divine atemporality really confusing, uh, and they don't help me. They haven't helped me at this point in my life spiritually, understanding God as being outside of time or locating these events outside of time. When, when I'm asking these questions about the Eucharist, I'm asking about the sacrament that I think I'm going to participate in tomorrow, and it's going to take, if my priest is on time, about 11 minutes. And it's going to be something that is really important to me, an important encounter with God for me that's happening in time. So some of the most important, like, pressing questions for me, just as a faithful Catholic, are about what's going on with this event in time. But this is definitely a move you can make. Say, like, Sullivan, you set up a, a false choice. We really just have to understand the Eucharist as an event that's happening outside of time, and then we don't get any of these logical contradictions. That's an option. Like, let's pick it up and let's just set it aside. Because I'm wondering if there are other ways we can make these claims consistent that don't require just adverting to God's atemporality. <coughs> Another thing we can do, and this is going to sound weird to those of you guys who haven't been like immersed in philosophy for a while, but it's, it's <coughs> totally normal to some of my colleagues, is say, no, actually, we did exist in 33 AD. And actually, the cavalry event is still occurring. You say, like, like, you're in the wrong spot tonight if this event is still occurring. Uh, let me talk a little bit about this view. I don't think we should take this route, but I think this is interesting just insofar as I promised you guys a little bit of philosophy of time tonight. So there's this big distinction in the metaphysics of time between A theories of time and B theories of time. These are the most boring names for philosophical views <laughs> that philosophers have ever come up with. But briefly, According to the B theorists of time, there really is no past, present, future distinction. There's just a bunch of events, and some events happen earlier or later than others. And that's all there is to the nature of time and the passage of time. I'm going to give you a model in a second to help you make this make sense. According to the A theories of time, there is an important distinction between the past and the present and the future. It's out there. There's a real difference between the past and the future. This is the present moment. And that's something that any good theory about the nature of time should reflect. To get a little bit clearer on this, I, the way I teach this to my students is once you understand the B theory, it's pretty easy to understand the A theory, because the A theory is just there's something else on top of the B theory. So once you understand the B theory, the A theory is just like, that's not the complete picture of reality. So here's an idea of the B theory. The B theorists think that space and time is spread out like one big block or manifold. And it's the kind of thing that you can slice up into different times. So we've got this big block in space and time, and maybe one slice of it is when the Peloponnesian War is happening in 431 BC, and another slice of it is when the Vietnam War happens in 1967, or a stage of it, and another event is 2017, the event of us being here tonight having this discussion. And you can slice this up, and if we zoom in on a particular block, like we pick 1967, and zoom in on that part, we can see the events of the Vietnam War occurring. But we can also zoom back out again and zoom in on 431 instead. We get the Peloponnesian War, and we zoom back out to the block, and we can zoom in on 2017, and we get this event, Boromir Summary. And all change is on this picture is just variation in this big block. To look at the American flag in the back there, it might make sense for us to say that the American flag changes colors as you scan across it. But it doesn't really change colors. It's just that one little part of it, if you focus in on it, is blue. Another little part, if you focus in on it, is white. Another is red. And all of it, if you take a step back, it's all just statically red, white, and blue. The bee theorists think that way about space and time. It's not, it's not like we could ever take this step back out of the space-time area. But if we could, we would just see this big spread out variation in everything with all the events really occurring. And events that could be in the block go like right around here. 33 AD could be the cavalry event. It could just be out there in the big space-time block still occurring. We're just over here. We're not able to access it in any causal way, but it's still very much real and existing. 
And likewise, from the standpoint of the cavalry event, you, know, you put yourself in the shoes of one of those Roman soldiers, we exist just as much as that soldier exists in his time. It's just that we're really far in the future and he can't interact with us. So that's how a bee theorist might talk about the passage of time. It's a pretty weird view, uh, but it's one that's taken quite seriously in philosophy of time circles. I'm an atheist of time. So the atheists say there's more to time and change than that. It's not just one big spread out block. There's definitely a distinction between the past and the future. The present, what's happening now, is more real than anything that's happened in the past or anything that's yet to occur. These are all things I believe. I can give you my reasons, which are kind of complicated for that later on. But I would like to understand the Eucharistic sacrifice in a way that takes the difference between the past and the present and the future really seriously. I'm not comfortable with this assumption that we all exist just as much at every time as we do now. And I'm not comfortable with the idea that the Eucharistic sacrifice, in a sense, is over, because it's over in its part of the block, but it's not really over. It hasn't really been completed, because it's still happening over there in this part of history. Does that kind of make sense? All right. So I don't want to go that way, but that is a way, if you were a really sophisticated bee theorist, you could try to also make sense of it being an eternal sacrifice without it being a sacrifice that happens outside of time. It's just a sacrifice that's happening over there, the same way that there are important events happening elsewhere in the world right now. Another option, uh, which is an option some of our Protestant counterparts are very happy with, is to go after the second premise. To say, look, when we celebrate the Eucharist, we're not really participating in that event. We're memorializing that event. We're remembering that event. We're in a certain way asking God to come participate with us in a memorial of that event. But the event, it's over. There's no way that this Mass is helping us participate in that event anymore. That's an option. I talked a little bit about the end of the talk about why I'm not satisfied with that option, but briefly, that's not the Catholic Church's teaching, and that's not explaining what's happening to me, I think, when I'm in the presence of the Eucharist. I don't think, you know, when you're involved in Eucharistic adoration, it's just a really profound memorial, the kind of memorial I could do equally well sitting in my living room, not in the presence of God. I think that something is happening there that's pulling me into that event in a real way. And that's a bit of data I want to preserve. <clears throat> so I get the question, can we build a metaphysical model? How would we understand events as Catholics that could make all five of these claims come out true? And again, what we're doing when we're building a model in philosophy of religion is we're not saying this is how God makes himself present to us and helps us participate in the Eucharist. Some of that we require really heavy theology to understand. Some of it is a mystery. We just might not be able to understand it. What we're trying to do as philosophers is just trying to figure out, could these views all be consistent? Is there some way of understanding events that could make it possible that all of these things be true? And once we do that, then you know, we've used our reason to open up a little space that hopefully our faith can then fill in the details for us. So that's what I'm aiming to do when I propose this model. There might be other models as well, but just try to show how the five can be consistent. And to do that, I need to give you guys a theory of events. So this would also horrify some of my philosophy colleagues, this idea that you would take data from some of the weirder parts of the Catholic faith and use that to try to inform a big picture philosophical question, like what is an event? But I'm much more loosey-goosey than that. I think like we can use our ideas in metaphysics to raise questions about our religions, and likewise use details from our faith to help guide us towards constructing new metaphysical pictures of things. So what I'm gonna do in the last bit of this talk is describe for you a picture about how events might work generally that can help us make sense of the claim that we are participating in the cavalry event when we celebrate the Eucharist. And in the process, we can raise some interesting questions about the metaphysics of events and some really interesting questions I think about the philosophy of religion. So here are my five claims, and I'm just going to go through them one by one and give examples. I think that's probably be the easiest way to get a handle on my picture. I'm going to use a simple example of an event to get the picture going, and then we're going to apply it to the more complicated case of what's happening when we celebrate the Eucharist. So first thing I want you guys to believe, at least for our talk tonight, <coughs> is that events, whatever they are, are the kinds of things that are typically broken apart into stages or composed of stages. So maybe an interesting question about whether you could have an instantaneous event 
That's another talk. I don't know the answer. We're gonna we're gonna assume for purposes tonight that events always have stages. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine I'm gonna have an event of making an omelet. This is a great event. And the event might be broken down into three stages. So the first stage is setting the mise en place. My French is horrible, but this is the part where you crack the eggs and you chop up the onions and you set out all of your things before you start cooking. Stage one of the great omelet event, setting the, setting the pieces out. Stage two, I'm actually cooking the omelet, frying the eggs, putting in the stuff at the right time, trying to keep it from burning. Stage three of the great omelet event is the great cleanup. So I've got all my stuff in the kitchen later and I'm washing up afterwards. Hopefully this seems like a reasonable way of speaking about the event of making an omelet. It can be cut up into these different parts. We can do it even more fine grain if we wanted to, but let's just keep it with 30. Second part of our theory of events. Now we're getting a little bit more complicated. Some event stages can depend on other event stages in the following sense. They only count as being part of this bigger event because some other event stage occurred. So what do I mean by this? Let's go back to our omelet example. Suppose I set out all of the pieces to make the omelet, but then I get distracted and I stop. I have not made an omelet. There's no omelet making event that occurred in my house that day. There's an event of cutting up onions and cracking eggs, but that's it. There's no omelet making event. That stage by itself depends on, sorry, I went the wrong order. That stage by itself depends on me going through with the cooking. Otherwise, it doesn't count as making an omelet at all. Likewise, I might just find myself with a bunch of dirty dishes. I'm worried when I get home to South Bend tomorrow, I'm going to find myself with a bunch of dirty dishes. Just having dirty dishes, but not having done any cooking, doesn't mean that those dishes are part of the omelet event. Certainly, if they happen a lot later, like four days after the cooking of the omelet, the omelet event's over, and those are just, that's just a dishwashing event. They can't be part of it anymore. So these events, these stages, one and three of the omelet event, depend on the second stage for, for even being part of the event in the first instance. But sometimes in events, there are event stages that don't depend on anything else. Just their very occurrence is the event. They're not at all dependent on anything else. So an example, and now we're getting a little bit wackier, is you can imagine, like, I'm in my kitchen, and then the mise en place just appears. Like, ex nihilo, from nothing, all of the food is ready, and I start the cooking, and I flip the omelet, and I put it down, and then pff, everything disappears. The dishes are all gone. Events one and three, or stages one and three of the event never happened, but I still made an omelet. It was a weird omelet. It took a lot less time, but it was still the event of making an omelet, because the cooking part, the second stage of this, is independent. It doesn't require anything else happening. Other events can be added on to it, if you can imagine like Lego bricks or whatever getting stuck on, and they can be taken off, but this event can stand by itself and still be the event of making an omelet. Hopefully you guys see where this is going, but if not, don't worry. Fourth premise. Participating in any stage of an event is sufficient for participating in the event. This is maybe getting a little bit more controversial, and this is stuff that we can, metaphysics, we can argue about in Q&A. But here's the basic thought. Couch participating. I'm totally open to that. I, there's you know, probably a defect in the, the pictures, the model that I put up. But I think that's an interesting question. And come, you know, it's one of these areas where metaphysicians shouldn't answer that part of the question. It should be part of the theology. How do we understand? How do we understand the Last Supper in relation to, to Christ's death and resurrection? To, to change the analogy, we just yeah. say, if there was no Game 3 of the NBA Finals, we wouldn't say that the NBA Finals happened. Like, there'd be something missing from the event. Yeah. So we can say the same with the two of uh, both uh, the Last Supper and the Crucifixion. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great way to think. And again, this is one of these questions, like, I'm very open if the, the the, the most the core of the theology is like the Last Supper. Also, Jesus' death and resurrection had to happen to to change the world, to like you know perfect to, to, to make our salvation possible. So like, the Last Supper is part of that. That's a, a core part of the event happening. Then absolutely, um, that the model should accommodate that, and that's something we just we need a theolo the theological argument would be why we would believe that. So using your terminology and going back to the Eucharist 
stages. Yeah. Uh, we kind of believe that on stage three, we consume the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Yeah. But on the first stage of the Last Supper, uh, Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. So he separates, for lack of a better term, the two, uh, saying, this is body, this is blood. But uh, we believe that just by receiving the Eucharist, just by receiving the body or the blood, uh, say like flu season now, like when we receive just the body, we receive also the blood and also the soul and also the divinity of Christ. So how would you explain that in terms of the, your Calvary event and the philosophical theology? Um, those are also great questions. I maybe didn't have, I don't have a good theory of the, the real presence. So I think that that's what you're asking for. Like, how could all of this God be present to us in this way? Uh, one of the things I think we're doing when philosophers we try to do philosophical theology, something that's helpful, is try to try to answer a smaller question with a model for yourself first, and don't try to take all of theology at once because then. It's overwhelming. Uh, and for this one, I really just wanted to go after this question about how we could be present at this event that seems completed a long time ago. Um, the question of how someone like God is present to us in species is an incredibly difficult piece of metaphysics. And I honestly don't have much to add to what St. Thomas's theory was, which is he himself realizes is incomplete or still leaves lots of questions. Certainly not convincing to people who are not on the inside of the sacrament. It's not the kind of metaphysics that you can give to somebody or who isn't Catholic and they'll think like, oh, oh yeah, obviously that is the divinity of God present in this. Um, so this isn't meant to be like cheeky, just saying like, you're asking another very profound philosophical question, but one I don't, I don't even have any idea how to improve on what the churches are in teaching or, or offering any model that seems to make it any uh, any simpler. And I, and I think a little bit, uh, to honor your question, to answer the unity question that, that I raised at the very end of my talk, like how is this event part of the cavalry event, but other events happening in Episcopal Church is not part of the event, or the World Series not part of the event, part of that has to eventually come down to the fact that God is present in this way at this stage of this event here, but he's not <coughs> the other one. Um, so the real presence is going to do some of the work in like making my theory make sense in the first place. Um, but I don't have like answering this question about what, how God is able to do that. I got it. It's a great question and one that we have to think a lot more about. Um, okay. Well, I have absolutely no philosophical training, no theological training, so I feel a little bit like, like a bit of a room here. That's all right. But, um, <laughs> I kind of just wanted to say, A, that I appreciate your model as kind of a starting point for me to think about these things. So thank you for that. Um, I'm kind of watching my brain tumble around a bit. Um, one thing that I had a problem with, and I think this was partially addressed in the last question, I was yeah. too busy being nervous to notice, but um, was I was struggling with the fact that your definition of events would just as easily explain the um, Eucharist historically, like you could say, well, yes, of course, this is part, you know, this event, you know, oh yeah, well, obviously, the Eucharist stems out of the, the sacrifice on Calvary because historically, a bunch of people got together and yeah, they started doing this. Um, yeah. And I'm kind of wondering for myself how to kind of expand your model to um, to kind of make it not just an historical, like a historical series of events, but also like metaphysical. Of events, if that makes sense. Good. So, uh, metaphysics can have different meanings too. This is a great, this is a one. It's like, I, I'm always suspicious when I give a talk to somebody who's like, I'm not really a philosopher, but really sophisticated philosophy point. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ah, I don't know. I think you are. <laughs> Metaphysic, metaphysical can have very different meanings. Um, so some senses of the term, it means like having to do with things that are abstract or outside of time. That's not, when I talk about this as a piece of metaphysics or a metaphysics theory, that's not what I mean. I mean it just as a theory. I, I mean it as, uh, I mean metaphysical in a way of like talking about these as a, a parts of our reality. And that's it. The same way like historical events are part of our reality too. So in a sense I'm trying to give you 
uh, philosophical theory that makes it true that we are part of a historical event. That's also an event that's occurring outside of time. Uh, that's also an event that has this deep significance for a god that's also atemporal and has the, you know, these abstract philosophical questions in the background. But the question I, I, I want to answer is you know, maybe understood primarily as a historical question. How could this sacrifice that we're participating in tomorrow make it the case that tomorrow during that event, we, during that stage of that event, we're part of this much bigger event that's something that happened in time in history. That, and that, that's an important part of our devotional lives and our salvation to realize that. Um, so, I, did, that's, I think you're, if I'm confusing, uh, when I call this like a metaphysics of events, it's probably because a lot of times when people use the word metaphysics, they're talking about like something that's abstract or something that's outside of time. And I was just using metaphysics as like a code word for philosophical theory, trying to make things logically consistent. Yeah. You know, because I mean, I'm perfectly easy to go out nothing myself and say, oh, well, it's just a historical event, of course, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, in order to. It was a crazy historical event, though. It was, yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> God <laughs> died and was resurrected. But, but, um, but in order to. It's a great historical event. Bringing the kind of the, the, the excitement to me in. Yeah. That's, that's where I'm at. So I'm not like worried about the words, I'm more worried about just. Yeah, so I totally take this point. You say, like, okay, Sullivan, you've convinced me that it's logically possible for somebody to participate in the cavalry event. But look, when I go to church tomorrow, that's not what I'm really excited about. I'm very excited about being in the presence of God. And this is part of the reverential stance, and this kind of second personal relationship I have with God that's mediated by the sacrament. Fair enough. In fact, like I said, don't think about this talk tomorrow when you're at church. That would be an error. That'd be a missed opportunity. <laughs> Think about this at brunch. <laughs> um, but instead of you know, just trying to show that this is like one small aspect, it is an important part of our devotional life when we're in, when we're in the presence of God, when we're uh, when we're accepting the Eucharist, to think of like not only the fact that we're in the presence of God, but that we're participating in sacrifice. When Saint Paul says we have to we have to die and be resurrected with Christ in order uh, we have to die with Christ in order to be resurrected with Him. And this is the, one of the means by which we're able to do that. So you know, the fact that we're able to participate somehow in this historical event is really, it's really important for us. But it's probably not the proper object of your focus or devotion when you're celebrating the Eucharist. It should be the fact that it should be the real presence. The much harder question that I, you know, I think philosophers need to, need to do much more work on understanding or providing adequate models of Maybe it's impossible to. Maybe that's always going to be enough of a mystery that there, it's just unmodelable by analytic philosophers. And, and I'm open to that option as well. This will be our last question, Mike. Thanks, Sullivan. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we, at the end of Mass, we say the Mass has ended. Does that mean that stage three is over and now there's a stage four? Or does that mean that the whole Cal Calvary event is over when we say that? Good. <laughs> <laughs> So again, I'm not a priest, <laughs> which is a good thing in my particular case. I think whenever, like, what is it? The Calvary event's completed. So one of our data points has to be that, like, when Jesus said it's finished, it was finished, and then the resurrection, like, that's complete in and of itself for our salvation. And then we have these stages that 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 are dependent stages of us participating in that event. When exactly does the Eucharist? the sacrifice of the Eucharist, and, that's where I said, it didn't, did they teach you this in, like, seminary? Is it, is it the dismissal? Is it? We don't you know, say it, it's over anymore. We just say go. go. Just say go. Right, go in peace, or go and glorify the Lord. Yeah. Right now, so it's all the easier. So it's vague, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> no. Yeah, the new translation doesn't have masses ended anymore. Okay. All, yeah. But at one time, it did, it doesn't matter. I mean, at least at one time, it, at least at one point in time, it was still in play, so. Yeah. And that means it's still in play. Yeah. It could be the case, too. I mean, I'm open to, it's, it's at least possible on this metaphysical model, but now we're getting super speculative, theologians, whatever, we need to make the theology work, I'm open to. But this idea that each of these third stages are starting but never ending. So each time, you know, each time we celebrate the Mass, we're starting a new stage of Christ's work. Yeah, World Series has endings, but it doesn't have to be the case. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the case, maybe necessarily, that our participation in the Eucharistic sacrifice ends at the end of each Mass. It, at least, for all the metaphysics is concerned, it doesn't have to be the case that it ends. It could be that each time we celebrate the Eucharist, we're starting a new stage 
of what Christ is doing. And I, and again, I deferred on the theology to the experts, but that's something that like a model like this could allow. Especially if you're willing to say that there are some events that don't happen. Like, like and then I, I don't know, a pretty good candidate would be like Christ's work of salvation in the world. If we're going to, like, World Series needs to have an end, but this one maybe doesn't. Uh, so I'm open to that. I think that's an interesting suggestion. Or, or like another way that you could like develop the model and then fill in the gaps depending on your theological convictions. Please join me in thanking them. Namely, the death and resurrection. That's the independent event. 
the cavalry event. This is when the omelet gets cooked. Now this metaphor is sounding horrible. <laughs> this is the event that locks it in. The event that's complete in and of itself. It could have happened without all the window dressing. But the other events, the dependent stages, get to be part of this event somehow. And when we celebrate later on, these are also stages of the same event, but dependent stages, the same way the cleanup in the omelet is a dependent stage. I think this is a reasonable model, or at least if we take those five assumptions about events seriously, there's no logical contradiction in believing those five claims that I think Catholics and Orthodox Christians believe about how we're able to participate in the Eucharistic event in time. But it does raise some questions. Any of you guys should think this is super easy. So here are some questions that I came up with, but I'm sure you guys are going to have even better ones. I want to put these on the table and what I think about them, and then I'm hoping we can just open this up for a big discussion about the Eucharist. First question you might ask is, why is an event that's happening at the Basilica of the Sacred Heart, that's a church I go to in South Bend, why does that count as part of the cavalry event, part of this event of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection, but like the sixth inning of the fourth game of the World Series does if, if they're all gappy and all these stages are spread out, how can we know that this thing that this community of Christians is doing tomorrow counts as part of the event, but this other thing that, you know, a group of people are doing a year ago doesn't count. I call this the unity puzzle. This is a puzzle for any metaphysical theory of events. And I think we Catholics have a couple good answers to this. One is by adverting to the real presence. To so say an event counts as being part of the cavalry event just in case God is really present at that event in this form. And God wasn't present in that way at the World Series, but he was he is going to be present in that way, the Mass. So that's using one bit of complicated metaphysics from the Church to answer this other metaphysical question about event unity. Another thing is, you might think, and this is not, not necessarily incompatible with the real present solution, but you might think God has the power to just stipulate through his Church which events are going to count as part of the cavalry event going forward and which ones aren't. So again, going back to the World Series metaphor, a referee can say, we have started the fourth game of the World Series, and there doesn't need to be anything special ontological to happen. The referee just has the authority to declare that now these events are linked up in a certain way. Likewise, Christ, when he stipulates, this is my body, this is my blood, do this in remembrance of me, hands it down to the church, gives power to the priest to say those things. He's, he's basically making them umpires of this event, able to take an event in our space and time and link it up with this event in the past in such a way that it makes it part of this big overarching event. That seems to also be a reasonable part of the story. So I don't think we're in big trouble at all with the event unity puzzle, especially given how unique this kind of event is that we're wondering about. Another question is, why should you care? So this is a question we'll get from some of our Protestant counterparts. Why isn't it fine that this is just a memorial of an event that happened in time in 33 AD and that we're going to realize when we're with Christ someday in the eschaton? Why care that we're part of the event besides the fact that this is official teaching of the Catholic Church? I think, one, it's important for the proper understanding of Scripture. I think it's also really important because Catholics have a unique way of dealing with what we call in philosophy the problem of divine hiddenness. How many of you guys are familiar with the problem of divine hiddenness? Maybe come up. Interesting. So there's a big dispute about how exactly to draw the lines of the problem in philosophy, but basically the gist of it is if God exists and he loves us and he's all-powerful and morally good, and knowing about God is extremely important for our lives, both our temporal well-being and our spiritual well-being and our eternal lives, then why would God make it so hard for us to know about him or encounter him? Why would God be so absent from the world? A loving parent or somebody who had some really important information that needed other people to know should make it really obvious that that information is true, should be really present, second personally, to the people they love. But God isn't like that. We've known this even since the Old Testament. People, the, the Hebrews are constantly wondering about why God is so absent. This is a puzzle in philosophical theology, and it's a puzzle for how we understand God's goodness and God's power. One thing that's really interesting for Catholics when it comes to the problem of divine hiddenness is we don't have a very absent God. I mean, something's not hidden if you can eat it, 
or drinking. And that's like as visceral and intimate as a relationship as you can get with God. But we have this puzzle of why that's the way that we get information with God. That, why that's the way that we get access to God. And how we should go about uh, appreciating that if we think this is a real fact in our world. I think if you have the Eucharist as a mere memorial view, one of the things you do is make the problem of divine hiddenness much harder for your theology. Because there's nothing that we can point to. There's nothing you can point to that's in the world that's God's physical presence or information about God or things that you can experience that are of God. But one upshot of Catholic theology is we, we do have that. Like, you can say that God's hidden from us in certain ways. His intentions are hidden from us, maybe. His nature is hidden from us. We don't know why he permits the evils that he permits. But at least in some way, God is physically present to us. And that's something, if you go the mere memorial route, for how we understand the Eucharist, it's something that we lose. You might also think, why not believe that when we participate in the Mass, we're just kind of like running a rerun of the original sacrifice, rather than like adding a stage to it, or participating in one of these dependent stages. Um, I think there are a couple reasons for not wanting to run like a rerun, or some people I've heard described as like a time travel model of the Eucharist, so like every time we participate in the Eucharist, Jesus is involved in a certain kind of time travel, like you know these, he was dying on the cross and being resurrected, and now he's doing the same event, but it's happening with this bread and wine somehow, but it's the same event, it's just like it's occurring in some weird temporal loop. Besides the fact that that's like, seems to me shady metaphysics, and not the kind of thing that a Catholic has to believe to understand this sacrament, I think it also poses some serious theological problems. We do want it to be the case that the Calvary event was complete. Uh, when Jesus said it's finished, he'd finished the work that he was doing for us, and now we are participating in it in a much further time, really participating in the event. But it, it is complete and independent in and of itself. I also think, and it's the church's teaching, that this sacrament has a power to pull us together into a church, to make us participating in one great event that Christ is at the center of. And participating in an event that people who we've never met, who existed long before Christians, who existed long before we came on the scene, also participated in. We get united into a church with them when we participate in this event. And if you think we're just rerunning it all in our own separate church each time, you lose that ability of this event to be one big thing that the Christian faith is participating in every single time it's celebrated. So that's an upshot of going for a model like this rather than like a kind of rerun model. Let's go back to how we started this talk, though, and I want to make sure we have a lot of time for Q&A. What's the point? You know, the Q theory of events relies on some... Ideas about metaphysical dependency and what makes one event the same event versus different events. This is all really cute. Why should it matter? Well, like I said at the beginning, I think when you are in the presence of the Eucharist, you go to Mass tomorrow, don't think about my talk. Don't think about where you're going to brunch. That's really hard sometimes for people. Don't think about anything but the fact that you're in the presence of God. And appreciate this event. Be very grateful for it and humble yourself before it. But, when we take a step out of Mass, when we're trying to understand how our faith could be consistent, one, I think it's a very referential thing to wonder about this, to wonder how we could really be part of this event that we think is historical, rather than just treating it as a nice story that we're reminded of when we go to Mass. Two, I think in the process of building these models, one, we discover new areas of philosophy, or new questions we didn't even think to raise in ordinary philosophy before, but we also maybe start to understand possible ways that God could be loving us and reaching out to us. And one of those ways is by letting us somehow participate in this event that all of the church gets to be a part of. And that's an area where I can only speak for myself, but thinking about these questions as a philosopher can actually really help my spiritual life. It makes me take that part of the Mass much more seriously. I don't think about it while I'm in this relationship with God, but outside of it, it's part of, you know, part of thinking about this as something that's valuable to my intellectual life and not just something that's a, a visceral second personal experience of God. So I think that's important. Now, of course, any time you give a philosophical theory, there are more objections than there are people who think it's the best. So I'm very happy to talk about that. I'm also happy to entertain other ways people have tried to understand this part of the, the sacrament. I'm very grateful for you guys for coming out tonight and having this discussion with me. Thanks.
I'll come over to you with the microphone. We'll be the I'll ask general philosophy of religion questions too. Michael, well, priest can correct me in my, in my theology. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So as Catholics, we believe that the Eucharist is both it's a sacrifice and it's a meal. Yeah. So it's both Calvary and it's also the Last Supper. Yeah. You had mentioned in your analogy of when you were talking about it that the Last Supper was just one of the stages prior to the event, namely the Calvary event. Um, in the example, the analogy with the omelet, would you say that the person who helps clean up is actually participating in the setting up as well? Or is that person just simply <coughs> participating in the act of making the omelet? Good. So this is, and like I said, I, you guys are the first people I'm trying this out for, so I'm hoping we can get even more clear on some of these assumptions tonight. One of, one of the parts of the theory that I think we need to make this work as a good model for a Catholic faith is this claim that if you participate in any stage of an event, you get sufficient for participating in the event. And then Mike yes. raises this interesting question. OK, so participating in a stage means you get credit for the event. But does that also mean you get credit for other stages of the event that you weren't present for? So if Mario Vitale shows up to do the dishes, does he get credit for setting up in the beginning? I think that's a really good question. I don't know. It seems like for this to work as a model of the Catholic faith, uh, this is a great question. And I think it partially depends on what we want to say about the, the event of participating in the Eucharist as participating in that meal versus participating in the event of which that meal is a part. It seems like pedantic at a certain point, but to what extent when we participate in the Eucharist, are we at the Last Supper with the disciples? It's a way of taking your question. And if we want to say yes, like that's part of the Catholic faith. Is we're not only there for Christ's death and resurrection, participating in, participating in it in this way. Like we're part of the event of which that's the, the core part. But also we're there for each of the key stages. I think this model could permit that. I think it's a little bit strange for us to talk about events this way. Say like I went to the World Series this year and I went to the seventh game. Six, I didn't go to any of the games by the way. But, but I went to, suppose I went to the sixth game, you say, went to the World Series this year, and somebody asks, were you there at the first game? And I say, yeah, because I went to the World Series. No, you didn't go to the first game of the World Series, you only came to the end. Um, so that, that seems like that would be a reason to think this model couldn't support, saying that, that we are participating in the event of the Last Supper, the event that happened at 3380. But if that's an important part of spirituality, then we need to find some the, of our faith and how we understand the Eucharist, then we've got to massage this premise to make that make sense somehow. I think that's a fascinating question. Love it. Also, priests and people that know the theological answer should definitely weigh in. Because like I said, I'm a humble philosopher, a metaphysician. I'm just here to tell you guys about events. <laughs> <laughs> what we have to believe for salvation is up to you guys, poor man. But I think that's a great question. Hi, Dr. Sullivan. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about types of dependence. Yeah. I can think of three necessary dependence unnecessary dependence and maybe mutual dependence, which might be um, a subset of one or both of them. Are there other types of dependences and could the way we understand the dependence of the Holy Mass on the Calvary event have an effect on our understanding of participation as well? Yeah, um, this is a fantastic question. Will you remind me of your name? Uh, Father Kevin. Father Kevin. Dependence is this is going to sound really, uh, really boring to civilians in the audience. Dependence is the hot topic in metaphysics right now. This is what like, a lot of the big research in philosophy is on at the moment. There's kind of, there's been this kind of rediscovery of Aristotle and questions of uh, the nature of ontological dependence and whether or not there's a fundamental level of reality. Just to say, your question opens a huge can of worms that's going on in the back of my mind when I think about this question for events. Naively, the way I was thinking about it is kind of the way we talk about, might talk about parts sometimes being dependent on a whole in a certain way. So uh, imagine like this, uh, my finger has to be connected to me in a certain way to count as like my finger or even be a human finger. If it were detached or if it were made in a lab, it wouldn't be, it definitely wouldn't be my finger. It might not even be a human finger. There's other parts of me that are maybe independent that don't have that. Like, maybe my entire torso or my head or this part of me. 
uh, that, that's independent in a certain way. So sometimes parts depend for their nature on being part of a bigger whole, and sometimes parts don't have to be that way. They can be the core. I was thinking about that when I was thinking about, like that's roughly the model I was thinking of when I talk about dependent stages and independent stages for events. But this is pretty sloppy, and, and I think you're totally right that there are lots of different ways we can understand. I'm understanding this as a kind of dependence that's relevant to this question of state, when stages are members of a big event. So it's something myriological as a term we use in philosophy. It's something having to do with what makes a stage a part of a bigger event. And it's a kind of dependence relation that's real that answers that question. Uh, I don't have anything deeper that I wanted to say about, about it than that. Um, the necessary or contingently dependent, I, I, I guess I'd ask you for some examples of how you wanted to use those well, terms. It would, it, would, okay. it would seem to me that the cleaning up after making your omelet would be unnecessarily dependent. Because you could clean up a lot of different things, yeah. not necessarily an om just an omelet. Um, but you can't tap into the Eucharist by any other thing. So there's like a certain particular type of dependence. Yes. And also then like the, when I talked about mutual dependence between the Last Supper and the crucifixion, that's a sort of mutual dependence I'm yeah. wondering. I don't, I don't know. I'm just wondering if there is different types of dependence that could actually make this make a little bit more sense in my mind. Yeah, I think... Rather I, than just saying, this is dependent on this. Yeah. So the way I'm also thinking about this project is, like, you know, introduce some vocabulary and draw the analogy. But then we're going to fill in the details and, and make it much more specific, depending on the theological desiderata that we have. And this is something, again, I'm, I'm humble enough to say I want to turn this over to the theologians. So is it the case that, like, our understanding of the Last Supper means that it's mutually dependent on the crucifixion and resurrection, or, or it's a certain way dependent upon those events for its meaning. This is stuff I would love to be like taught about. Or I'd like to like we need to look into the theology. Uh, I, I think it's a great just to say I think these are fabulous questions to ask. Um, and once I didn't mean to take a strong stand on that here. I just meant to kind of show how we'd set up the model that would yeah. possibly make the claims consistent, and then want to fill it in with the rich theology later and by people that are more capable of understanding and the meaning. Uh, also, really, uh, uh, Father Kevin, on your point, uh, and also your question about like what uh, your question about no, not just any cleaning up matters yeah. for uh, for our participation in the Eucharist. I think that's absolutely right, and that's that's kind of what I was getting after when I talked about the event unity puzzle of like why is it the case? You know, imagine our. Um, our compatriots in Anglican churches who are celebrating right. uh, communion tomorrow. What makes it the case that like what we're doing is part of this event, but what they're doing I think is not part of it. It's a memorial of the event. These that, that's part. Of, that's also a metaphysical question yeah. in this picture, and not just a theological question. Uh, Joe, um, yeah. back to the theology. Um, you know, in terms of theology, it seems to be in Kronos and Kairos time. To what relationship is that between? A and B, or is there? Um, how does it relate to the greater tradition there? Yeah, give me the definitions of Kronos and Kairos. I don't know. This is I've heard about it, but I don't know this very well. Oh, it would it, it would be similar to A and B, wouldn't it? Though, in terms of look, well, Kronos would be more <laughs> in the second. That's such a cheap thing. I just said, why don't you go on in terms of that's it. So yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, so if anyone wants to pipe in, so yeah. Kronos would be more time, as we understand, in terms of sequential, yeah, in, in, in theories of temporal. Whereas Kairos would be more of, eh, I don't want to be too loosey goosey yeah. here. Uh, the timelessness or the eternal now, uh, kind of Greek terms. Yeah. So yeah. In, in that regard, you know, we kind of have a bit of a theological distinction between yeah. these two types of times. Yeah. How would that relate to A and B? This is a question where I, I'm too uninformed on the relevant theology, I think, to, to speak intelligently about it, except to say that this is a big question in analytic philosophy of religion. Brian Leftad, who I, I mentioned wrote the Latin Trinity paper, has also done a, uh, some very interesting work on how you would be a presentist about God Really briefly, uh, presentists are, are a theorists, so people that take past, present, future distinction really seriously. 
So they think only the present's real. There's an important sense in which our past and which our future is unreal. And then you have this question of like, what's going on for someone like God who's outside of time? And left out is this very interesting argument that God himself could enjoy his own eternal present outside of time, different from our present, but he's able to you know, reconcile God, facts about God's foreknowledge and our freedom using this model. I know he engages with this question. Um, there's, a big, there's a very interesting debate in secular philosophy of time right now about the best way to be an atheist, and I, I have a lot of horses in this race, so I'll give it to you very briefly. One question is, if you really take the past, present, future distinction seriously, should you be a presentist? So should you just believe only 2017 is real? There's no other time or space in reality, period. It's just this event now that's the reality. Or should you believe that, in fact, there is a sense in which the past and the future are real? There is a sense in which there is this space-time manifold, but nowness or presence is something that's like moving across it or sweeping across it. Um, that's a really live debate right now. Some people think that one model is better for handling assumptions from physics, like the view of time that we get from special and general relativity. Other people think you have to be a B theorist to understand the view of physics, the view of time we get from physics. Complicated debates, but these might map onto your. I bring this up because it might map onto your uh, your question about how these distinctions in metaphysics of time bear on these theological distinctions. Because one of the big questions is: suppose God, we, we think of God in the sense that He's outside of time, looking at all time. Is He looking at a space-time manifold? Is He looking at a manifold with a now that's moving across it? You get into these, you know, really great philosophy questions of like, does does God know that it's 8:05 p.m. If God's outside of time, He's not in the light. You know, these are they, those are big questions. The theological distinctions, I don't feel really confident speaking on, except just to say this is a, a hot topic in philosophy and religion. Father Anthony Marshall. Thank you. She said it, Father Anthony Marshall. Um, then this month we begin Lent, and at the end of Lent we enter the Paschal Triduum. Yeah. It's three sacred days, which is celebrated. I'm not a liturgical, sorry, I'm not a theologian, but my understanding, if I remember correctly, is one big liturgy that doesn't end until, begins on only Thursday night and concludes with the Easter Vigil, yeah. the Resurrection. So that Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and the Resurrection form one day, so we one, one liturgy. Yeah. Um, I think if you had your model there with the, um, not the omelet, but the post omelet. <laughs> the better omelet. Right. Or no, wait, you want Julia or you want Jesus? I want Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the first was the leading stage of that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of wondering if stage one is really part of stage two, and you call that the Paschal mystery. Yeah. The Paschal event. Yeah. Whereas the preparatory stage one, if you want, could be the, the life and mission of Jesus. Yeah. Before he enters those three sacred days, which form one. And that might, at least in my own simple understanding, yeah. I don't know if it's possible, but you know, what you were sp speaking of about the uh, Eucharist being both the sacrifice and the meal together yeah. as one. Yeah. And I'll leave it at that. The other thing I would have mentioned was in Hebrew, I believe, if I remember correctly from the Hebrew classes, there's only two tenses the present and the imperfect, so that the Semitic people would have had an understanding of now, this is happening, and then the imperfect, no idea of like a future or a past, just you're here, and then there's something that rudimentary way. Like yeah. People that others maybe have more scholarly knowledge of the Hebrew explain that further. Yeah, on the, on the Hebrew linguistics question, also I'd like to defer to my colleagues. Um, I will say, I will say one, one annoying thing about analytic philosophers is if we find that natural language doesn't help us express the concept we want to talk about, we just make up a new language and then we try to teach it to you. <laughs> no, we, never, we, never, we never feel bad by tenses in real language when it comes to asking these questions, but I take your point. Uh, I think the question you raised is a question, I already forgot your name. Michael? Father Anthony Marshall. Oh, uh, yeah. No, Michael. Michael, yeah. Michael also raised. This is, uh, this is an awesome question, and what I'd love for us to like think about as a group is when we say, you know, we're participating in this event, in the Eucharist, in the celebration of the Triduum, really important event coming up. How far back does it go? What should, what should we be thinking about in our devotional life when we're trying to enter into this referentially? This is a, you know, a great question, and the, the model is totally open. You know, we can go on together events, chuck them up however we want to to make the metaphysics work out. This is one where it seems like the, the theological and referential questions really come to the fore. 
So when you're counseling a parishioner about what aspects of Jesus' life she should be um, she should be meditating on in her devotions when she gets ready for these profound uh, sacraments, how far back do you go? Or is it all of it? Are we trying to just take in all of Christ's earthly life? So we're taking all of Christ and even his action in the world through the Holy Spirit now. Um, these are questions, these are, these are the questions that we want to turn to the theologians and the metaphysicians. We can make this model work however we want to chop it up, but those are the questions that we, we actually desperately need answers to, especially insofar as we want this philosophy to inform our spiritual lives. So that, I want to be kind of open-minded. And, so what do you think? What's the answer? <laughs> what, 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 I'm, I'm genuinely curious. What, what do you think? You know, I, I think, um, for me, the, the Last Supper is yeah. the Lord's Supper, because that Lord's Supper is kind of what we celebrate in Eucharist. Yeah, that was a typo. But the Last Supper and the Calvary event are one stage. Yeah. Maybe the preparatory event, if you will, would be like the church as in Palm Sunday, the beginning of Passion Week. Yeah. That could be the setting of the meal. Yeah. The setting of the table. And that whole thing that enters into that third stage that was reenacts. And that idea was eventually the Hebrew, I think, is that that idea of memorial and analysis, they didn't have a sense that something was bad. So when they celebrated the Passover, yeah. they were really at the Passover. Because yeah. for them there was no past tense or future. You yeah. were there. And that was I think it's important to bring in somehow as well. So yeah. <laughs> no, this is this is fantastic. It's definitely you know, this is part of the catechesis on this topic too. Um, so I'm not opposed to any of this as a recommendation. I, I was also trying to be cute and trying to set it up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, but yeah, I think uh, I think there's absolutely no reason why we can't put the cavalry at the, the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. Now you're getting romantic. <laughs> <laughs> you have a follow up? Yeah, on that same part, I would say stage three. Yeah. Because we have. Kronos and Kairos. Kairos means the real presence now. So in some ways, whenever we celebrate the Eucharist, it's always for us stage three. It's now. It's gathering the people now. It's moving the assembly of faith now. But we are so connected to stage two and one. So one and two are absorbed into the now because our Eucharistic theology shows us that in fact we are now women and men gathered into the risen Christ, which is beyond space and time, and shattered that. So, so Kronos, in some ways in the risen Christ, is no longer there. Uh, it leads to the present, but it redeems the past, present, and the future. And that's, I think, the challenge. Yeah. Our theology well, takes us beyond <laughs> our philosophy. Yeah, and one thing, I also don't mean for this in any way to be a complete model. One thing philosophers are doing is like showing a way these five claims could be consistent, but definitely not even close to the tip of the iceberg of our teachings about the Eucharist. I, and, you know, I've also punted completely the question of God's existence outside of time. One thing I think we've got to be careful of, and, and this model helps us keep in mind, there's one thing we don't want to say is our participation in the Eucharist sacrament, Eucharistic sacrament in any way is like completing a process that, that Christ started at Calvary but was incomplete at the time. So there's somewhere that like, you might think like the World Series wasn't over until the last game. It was ongoing. If somebody said it was over at the fourth game, they'd be wrong. But there is a certain way, there's not, there's, Christ's sacrifice wasn't over at Calvary, but there is a certain sense in which his sacrifice was complete. And what we're doing is dependent on that event. Uh, so we have to have some theory that allows us to talk in that way. And that, that's one of the real drivers I have for trying to devise this model. Is how can we talk in a sensible way about adding on to an event that's still complete, but in a way that we're still participating in? Um, so I think we're kind, of, we're kind of circling around this point. Uh, but it was just occurring to me that the, the, the model is still very, very linear. linear. Yeah. Um, as far as like when I when I receive Eucharist or let's say maybe Mark Wahlberg receives Eucharist, it's happening, you know, sort of in the cleanup stages. But how so we're participating in that event, you know, in a linear way, but how then do we say that, you know, Mary's immaculate conception is a participation in the celibate act which doesn't even occur until after her birth? I only wanted to solve five. <laughs> Are great questions, and, and uh, you know, how, how do we make it the case that 
people that um, whose lives were lived before the cavalry event to participate in that. Um, Again, I think these are great questions to wonder about, and they're ones that eventually, you know, we start developing the model, maybe, maybe it starts to strain under it, because it turns out we need... Well, one thing that might happen is, as we encounter these different teachings, it turns out that the metaphysics of events and time and change that Catholics need to get the whole theology together makes it very alien to the notions of events and time and change that are suited towards like more simple philosophy conversations, like the metaphysics of a baseball game. That's an open possibility. At a certain point, like you might do, make all, you know, the scientists know this, you make your small model of the atom, you make your small model of physical processes, and then eventually you try to combine all the models and it breaks. That's certainly an open option for philosophy of religion. When you get to a faith like Catholicism, with such rich and demanding theology, it might be the case that, you know, this is a simple model for trying to understand the Eucharist, but we added other aspects of our theology, and it just, it's clear that we needed to look in a completely different direction. And I'm open to that as well. But I don't think we should, uh, I don't think th there's a tendency, at least among some Catholics, of saying, well, it's a mystery. You know, it's a mystery. it got hard. Greg asked the Mary question, and I got confused, and so it's a mystery. I don't want to think about this anymore. I don't want to build these models anymore. I think that's too hasty because you know it's bad to throw out your models until you see exactly how they're contradicting. But the best way to uh, to pursue, I think, your intellectual life when you're asking after really difficult questions like the nature of God and His efficacy in the world is start with a simple model, try to get some claims to come out that are consistent, and then keep adding to it based on what you know and, until until it falls apart, and then go back to the drawing board. But don't give up too quickly. Um, so just to say, you have a really difficult question have some faith that we could eventually figure this out, or I hope that God would show us how to put it all together, but I don't at all think that's it. I don't have anything intelligent to say about how to say <laughs> Mary or people that pre-exist the cavalry event at this stage. All right, Alex? Thank you for your talk, that was great. Um, I have a question, actually, two parts of this. Okay, real quick, guys. Maybe I'm reading this wrong way, but it seems like Father Kevin's question may have answered Michael's question with the idea of would it be possible for there to be multiple necessary stages per event? So if that's the case, then the Last Supper and the actual crucifixion are two different stages, but both necessary for the Paschal Mystery event, yeah. if you call it. And then would that just be the idea of that be mutually dependent stages per event? Yeah, I think uh, I think this is a great question. It's one of these things that I I like to know. What you, like, do you think there's an argument for that way of understanding the the, the Last Supper's relationship to? Uh, clearly, they're part of the Trinity. So there's that argument. But understanding the, is the Last Supper dependent upon what God knows is going to happen next, or what God has ordained the death and resurrection to be the Last Supper to be part of? This, or is it the case that like it could have stood on its own? Remember that that was the kind of offhand test I gave for like the, the Julia Child example of like he set the table, but nothing else happens. There was no omelet making. Um, if you want to say that the Last Supper was independent, you would want to say that about it. That doesn't sound right at all. You might want to say we can't understand the crucifixion and the resurrection at all without the Last Supper. Like it ha that has to be part of. That the block or the interval to make sense. In which case, I think we'd want to say that, like, the core, complete, independent event starts at the Last Supper, ends with the Resurrection, and that's the anchor by which all of these other events 